Good morning, everyone. Let's read from Psalm 130, verse 7. It says, Israel, O Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. This verse um, reminded me of last week when Pastor Che was preaching, and uh, he said, All darkness is temporal because the power of of the cross of Christ. So Lord, we come to you this morning. Thank you that there is hope, Lord, that there is mercy anew, Lord, and that your grace abounds. Lord, it is inexhaustible. Lord, thank you that we can come back to you, Lord, our fountain of life, our fountain of hope and mercy. Lord, with you, there is hope. Amen. Let's sing together. One church, one faith, one anthem raised, God in God alone, one cross.
by your sacrifice and it's only through the blood of Jesus we come Amen Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Pastor Che, and I'm the EF pastor of the Cleveland KCPC Church here in Cleveland. I hope and pray that wherever you are, Salt Lake City, Utah, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, Boston, Massachusetts, Anniston, Alabama, Princeton, New Jersey, Dublin, Ohio, Blue Ash, Ohio, 
Parma, Ohio, the White House, and Cleveland. They're all safe and growing in your love and knowledge for, each, for God and each other during these difficult and historic times. Now, let me quickly go over the announcements at this time. We'll continue to have live streaming services at 10 a.m. on Zoom. And uh, we'll provide the links on our uh, website, cleankcpcem.org. We'll also send a link by the churchwide email. Uh, we'll also have it recorded later on our YouTube as well. You can continue to give online on our main church website and also our EM website. Uh, if, if you want to help also with a love offering that helps families who are struggling financially, you can do that as well. If you have a financial need yourself, please let me know and it will be confidential. We'll have a college Bible study this Wednesday at 7 p.m., I believe. If you, any, um, if you want more information, please contact our college director, Ms. Lydia Kane. If you're an undergrad student who's, wants, who wants to still be added onto our family group, you can contact Lydia as well. We'll have our young adult uh, family groups as well. Uh, and so if you, uh, it's gonna, uh, if you have any questions, uh, please, and you need to sign up, please let Mike, Mike Choi know, and he can give you more information. Our next Agape uh, Bible study will be on February 13th uh, at 5 p.m. We'll send you the Zoom link uh, via churchwide email and also our Agape Kakao Talk. Uh, we continue our preschool, uh, Zoom Sunday School led by Ashley Choi every Sunday at 9.15. Um, and um, we'll have our um, uh, prayer meeting this uh, Tuesday at 8 p.m. And so if you have any questions, uh, you can contact Claire uh, Chen as well. And also please continue to pray for uh, all those who are uh, first responders, medical professionals, teachers, parents, and students as well. Now at this time, if you can join me in confessing our faith, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father mighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only son and Lord, who's conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered on the Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father mighty. From death he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Knowing that we've all sinned, and fall short of God's glory, let us confess our sins to God together in silence. Friends, believe in the good news of Jesus Christ. In him we're forgiven. Amen. Let's pray together at this time. Father God, we thank you so much uh, for another day, this last day of January. We thank you so much for your scripture. It is more relevant than ever. It is living, it is active, it is timeless and also timely. Father, I pray that we at KCPC be a people of the word through all the changes of this culture, of this life, we can trust the infallible, uh, God-inspired words that are written for thousands of years, that Father, you are the living word, you are the life. You are our theos, you are our logos, you are, Father, our, our very salvation, our, our purpose in life. We thank you, Father, continually for the protection of our little community at KCPC. We thank you for all the leaders and their faithfulness. We pray, Father, for those who are struggling at this time, either through loss, some sort of suffering, some sort of uh, uh, medical condition, relational issues, maybe even depression. You lift them from this miry pit, this dark pit that they're going through. Father, I pray, Father, continually as well for, our, for the very young and uh, for those who are growing in their faith. I pray as parents, that we will guide them in the ways of truth, not the ways of this world, in the ways of the way you want us to train our kids. I pray also, fathers, those who have not been born yet, we pray for their health. We pray for future, future generations of our church. We pray, Father, those who are older, those who are uh, 
may be struggling uh, physically. We pray continually, Father, that look forward to the day when we'll all have glorified, perfect bodies. May we continue to live life in the eternal. And we thank you for this prayer that you taught us 2,000 years ago. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now at this time, we're going to read uh, from Romans chapter 8, verse 14 to 18. Romans chapter 8, verse 14 to 18. Sharing in his suffering and also sharing in his glory. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves, so that you live in fear and yet. Rather, the Spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with that Spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. And I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. This is the word of God. You know, on an ordinary like day like this, and I don't think I'm being melodramatic, you may receive the greatest gift that you've ever known or be hit by a storm that's going to rock your world. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to share you two stories, two true stories that happen about the same time. A great gift and a, and, a, and a terrible storm that happened around the same time. I think I told you guys the story in two, uh, about 12 years ago, in June of 2008, um, just out of the blue, I was at a Methodist church in Atlanta at that time. They told me, you have to go to Ohio next month. I'm like, what? Yes, you have to go to Ohio and speak at this youth retreat. It's called Camp Wanaki. It's the middle of nowhere. It's like, I think a few miles away from Massillon. That's where our worship leader, Phil, uh, is from, not the groundhog that's going to come out and predict the weather incorrectly this week. But I remember seeing Harry, I think Harry Rue was there. You guys know Harry? I think he was like in his, he was a teenager at that time, I believe. And at that time, he wasn't as buff as he is now. At that time, he only benched 314 pounds back then, okay? And so, um, I, and I remember just like, I had a bad attitude, I didn't wanna go because I had all these things in the summer to do, mission trips and things like that. Well, uh, during that retreat, I met a pastor who was in charge, his name was Pastor Daniel. And he happened to be the one, he happened to be the brother-in-law of my wife, Debbie. And he, he actually, you know, kind of like arranged everything for us to meet. And so five months later on January 21st, I still remember this, January 21st, 2009. I remember this because right after President Obama got inaugurated the day before, we drove through the night from Atlanta to drive all the way to Columbus to meet her. Okay, it's funny, January 21st, 2009. And then nine years later, I speak January 21st, 2018 at KCPC. That's a great gift. That's a great story. And the rest is history, right? Now, around that time, unfortunately, there was a pastor. I didn't know him that well. So a lot of the things I'm hearing that I heard about his life was through a, a good friend of mine that was really close to him. And he had, you know, he had a wife and I believe he had two kids, maybe three, and they were very poor. And so he couldn't even afford um, good tires for his minivan. So he moved from Atlanta to Southern California. And you know, Southern California doesn't rain a lot. And so, um, so in an instant, basically, he got into a car wreck because of his bad, he hydroplaned on the, on the road in the highway. And immediately his wife and his two kids died. He was in critical condition, but he was okay. And so I don't think I'm being melodramatic. On an ordinary day like this, you may receive the greatest gift that you have ever received and, or be hit by a storm that's just gonna rock your world. And you know, storms is a way of coming to our life, right? Now, from a biblical perspective, a loss is something that significant, that magnitude. And many of you guys have significant losses in your life. That it's not something you can totally recover from in this life. And as I start this message, I want to be real clear on the message this morning. It's not about how you can be as happy as you can and as soon as possible recover from something as, as terrible as that. Because loss is something that needs to be uh, set right. In the Bible, the word that's used is the word redeemed. And the Bible says that God's going to do that one day. The day is coming. It might not be today. It might not be tomorrow. It might not even be until God comes back. 
But until he comes back, we need to find a way to live and choose life in a world that is better from the storms of life. And sooner or later, guys, that storm's gonna hit your life. Maybe you love someone and they die. Maybe you have a relationship and they hurt you and that relationship dies. For, you, for some of you, the storm involves the family where you grew up and, you, you, uh, and you're, you're deeply wounded by what your father or mother might have told you or your siblings. For some of you, it's a life that you find disappointing. Maybe some of you went to a doctor recently and told you bad news and the health and the life that you always took for granted is now fragile. And for many of you, it involves the death of a dream. And so in the time that we have this morning, I wanna walk through some questions that human beings have been asking for a long time on this whole issue of loss and suffering. And then two statements that straight from this scripture today. And today, don't get mad at me, but today's like a part, part one or part, maybe part two or three, I'm not sure yet, depending on how it goes. But the first question I wanna to pose to those who are suffering from loss, okay, is why me? Why am I the one going through this? Was I singled out for some reason? Okay, did I do something? Okay, and sometimes we may su bring suffering upon ourselves. How many of you guys have ever gotten a, seat, a speed, uh, speeding ticket? You know, in this Zoom room, just raise your hand. How many of you guys ever, okay? You know, this is a forgiving church, so don't be afraid, okay? The follow-up question is, how many of you guys are actually speeding at the time you got a speeding ticket, okay? Okay, how many of you guys have sped in the past, but you didn't get a speeding ticket that you should have got, okay? I know this because I can't keenly remember how some of you guys drive in the, in the church parking lot. A lot of you guys speed in the church parking lot, okay? So there are certain sufferings that we bring upon ourselves, okay? If you eat a lot, eat very unhealthy, and sit around and do nothing without exercising, trust me, like during a pandemic, okay, you're going to gain a lot of weight, okay? A, you know, abusive, angry people are likely to end up lonely, okay? If you're a young person, and, uh, and you watch too much K-drama. I don't know why I've been uh, picking on K-drama lately, okay? Uh, but if, you if you're a young person and you watch too much K-drama, you'll wind up to be an oncologist, ophthalmologist, or a psychiatrist, okay? Because I don't know if you noticed, but I don't know, back in the day, K-dramas, you always had someone that died, had cancer, or went blind, okay? Or go blind, right? Now, you know, a lot of times, so we bring suffering upon ourselves. But I think some of the most deepest and most painful suffering includes, uh, it just comes for no apparent uh, reason, right? And part of what, why it's so hurtful, it wounds us so much, is because we have this illusion of control. We figure that if we're smart enough or clever enough or careful enough, that we're not going to go through loss or suffering. And just out of the blue, you, there's a tremendous loss, maybe in your family, disaster, a disappointment comes. And then you realize the truth, that on this planet, Life is extremely fragile for all of us. And it happens to the best and smartest and most careful of us, right? And I think this pandemic has been a great revealer, has really, really shown us that life, that we're not in control and life is very fragile. And, what, and I love what Isaiah says, it's so relevant today. He says, all flesh is like the grass. The days are like a flower in the field. The wind blows over it and it is gone, okay? Now when it's standing there, the flower feels very confident, but all it takes is a little wind, then it is gone, okay? Just like that pastor who lost his wife and two kids, okay? And I'm sure if he was here today, okay? And, and many of you guys have severe, suffered severe loss as well. I wonder if he was here today and he shared what some of his thoughts were after this great loss. I'm sure he'd be playing that scene thousand times. What if I left 10 seconds earlier, 10 seconds later? What if I'd taken another route? Why, did not, why didn't I buy those tires even when I was struggling financially? I mean, it seems like such a random event, right? And he may go through his whole life. He probably will go through his life and never, ever, never get his questions answered, okay? But maybe one day that question might, another question might strike him. He might ask in the face of suffering and loss, why not me, okay? In other words, why, why do we assume that it, suffering and loss doesn't happen to us? Am I really a better person than a baby born in a starving family in Somalia? I mean, how can I assume that I'm exempt? I think half of the agony that Christians go through is to surprise that something like this is happening to them. 
But you know, like many wise and loving people who've gone through horrendous loss in their life, I think hopefully this pastor that's lost so much that he'll ask probably the more important question, how will I respond? And that's the, first, that's the second question. It leads us to the second question today. How am I supposed to respond to deep loss when the sufferings of life, when the storms of life strikes? You know, earlier I mentioned that our suffering and loss sometimes become random or seem random or without purpose. I actually don't think that's true. You know, in the early centuries especially, you know, I think what set apart Christians from others were how they handled suffering. For them, pain had meaning in Christianity because Christianity brought a whole new view and perspective that the world had not seen in response to life struggles and sufferings and loss. You know, for just, just briefly, some of the different worldviews. I don't know, maybe your grandparents, you know, Buddhism, you know how they respond to suffering? Suffering is an illusion. Someone dies, if your baby dies, if your mom dies, it's okay. You didn't really lose your mother. You didn't really lose your baby because you know what? They're just part of the universe. Your goal in life is to escape suffering. Okay, nirvana is the absence of permanence, right? Nothingness is the goal. So don't be attached. Don't be attached. I think I told you this story. When I used to live in Chicago, I used to go to Art Institute a lot. If you go to the bottom, you see statues of Buddha. Have you ever seen a statue of Buddha? Okay, not, not like a living Buddha, okay? Or if your husband looks like a Buddha. But have you ever seen a statue of Buddha? It's indifferent. It's like peace. There's like a smirk sometimes, right? Have you seen the faces of the paintings of Christ? There's agony. There is hurt. There is suffering. There is love. You know, there are other philosophies like karmic philosophies, like Hinduism. You know what? Their, their view of suffering is very neat. It's very convenient. You shouldn't complain about injustice in your life, about suffering or loss in your life. You know how they will explain it? It's because you were evil in your past life. What you did in your past life is now your life has come to fruition. So if you're going to tremendous loss of suffering, it's because the way you lived in your past life. Okay? That gives no comfort at all, right? All right? So any unjust things that happen to you is because of your past life. How convenient, right? How convenient. But in Christianity, suffering is real. It's often, you know, it's often unjust because the world is full of injustice because of sin. But it's because it's broken. Because this is jacked up. But there is meaning. There is purpose. There is compassion. There is love because of Christ. I mentioned this before too, but my grandmother on my dad's side was the first in her family to become a Christian. She, she had my dad when she was 42 years old. She was born in 1894. And get this, I mean, look at all the suffering that she's went through. She lost her husband, okay, when she was in her 40s. Okay, she, lost, she, went, through the, she went through tremendous suffering during that time, uh, the Japanese occupation. She went through World War II, the Korean conflict, the Jeju Rebellion. Her own daughter died during childbirth. She lost her grandson, grand, grandkid. She also lost her son-in-law to execution. He was executed and lost her husband. She lost all her riches. She was raised in a rich family and she was a very devout Buddhist. But then a North Korean pastor that, that escaped North Korea told her about the love of God, that suffering has meaning. For her, Buddhism had no meaning. There's no comfort. It's just escape reality. But she met the Lord of creation, one who had love for her, that understood her pain and suffering. You know, life can be brutal. And for the most part, you know, when you land, when you fall, it's like, it's like concrete. I mean, wouldn't it be nice if there's like a sandbox that, you can, that can you know, cover you? But life is brutal. So how do we respond? I'll tell you one way that we don't respond, what the Bible says not to do. When you go through the storm of life, and I mentioned this last week, you don't pretend that it doesn't hurt. I think a lot of us grew up because we're, we have to be strong in Christ, that you never show people you're weak that you're grieving, that you're supposed to be like a Greek stoic. You ever, you, you ever read Greek stoic philosophy? That people who have emotions, who are, who are struggling, they're weak, they're le lower level being. But Jesus wept and he's the strongest being in the universe. And a lot of men and women, especially when they get older, they struggle with this. And sometimes in churches, we have this kind of culture that we have to be strong, we can't show emotion, we can't cry. And that somehow we're supposed to hide your pain through life, even though you go through tremendous suffering. It's a game, it's a, tr it's a terrible game, okay? And let me give you an illustration to help you understand this kind of game, okay? And because it's a game that we all play in the church. 15 years ago, I went to a week 
of infamy. I've showed the story. A pastor friend of mine and I were hired by these two rich Korean parents to take care of their four kids, okay? Their ages from eight to 12. That was a week, sorry for my language, a week of pure hell, okay? Our job was to drive from Orlando all the way to Orlando. They couldn't speak English very well. And they talked the whole stinking time, all the time. Talk, 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 talk. And my wife makes fun of me because my Korean is terrible. She says that whenever I speak to my parents, I speak in the same grammatical form like Yoda in Star Wars. And I, I speak like an octave higher and much slower. And then I end all my sentences with ya, eta, or uta. Let me give you an example. I tell my parents, restaurant we go to, ya, or uh, church we worship God, gada. Okay, so I, that's how I talk to my parents. It's kind of like, it's kind of, you ever heard, this sounds, this is inappropriate, so who cares? It's like, a, you ever heard a German guy? You know, when they speak German, it's very masculine, very tough, like, um, I dry, dry, fear. But when they speak English, it's like an octave higher, and they say, do you want a hamburger? Yeah, have you noticed? It's kind of like that, okay? But I remember speaking to them, it says, game, we do, why don't we play that, okay? Let's have fun, yeah, okay? And so, and so we play this quiet game, okay? And, um, and this is how, if, if, if you keep quiet, whoever keeps quiet the longest, you're gonna get ice cream when you go to Orlando, okay? And so these Korean kids are very smart. You know, after just a few minutes, they're like, you know what, I'm not gonna play this quiet game anymore, okay? This is the land of the free. I'm gonna do what we're gonna, I'm gonna do. Anyway, my parents are paying for you guys. You are the servants, we are the masters, okay? So they thought that the, these pastors are not gonna punish them if they didn't, you know, if they didn't play. Because, you know, but they had no idea that pastors could be evil too, yeah, right? And so they're like, so when we got to Orlando, it was hot, tub. it was humid, tub, okay? But we, I remember we, we bought ice cream for ourselves first. No, no ice cream for you, okay? No soup for you, okay? And that's what we said, but eventually we gave them ice cream, okay? But don't we do that in the church? We, we play this quiet game, okay? We, we don't share our prayers with people. Okay, we don't, we, don't, we don't tell people what we're going through. And, and we think we're being strong. We think we're being faithful. That kind of thought does not come from the Bible. Now I mentioned last week from Psalm 88 that we can shout, we can cry, we can even curse at God. That 70% of the Psalms are lament. If you guys ever read the book of Lamentations, you should read that in the morning. It's a very cherry book, okay? And, but the God is a God, is a, he's a great God. He's not threatened by your anger. He's not threatened by your frustration. And some of you have been playing the quiet game way too long. And you never really mourn over your losses. You never dealt with your suffering. You never asked for prayers from others. That's actually prideful, actually, because you're saying that you can handle this by yourself. And we all need help. We all need community. You know, I say this a lot, that you're only loved to the extent that you are known. But I think you can also transpose it in this context. You're only cared for, you're only healed to the extent that you're known. And when you share your issues, it also gives other people in your community the great gift of mourning with you. I find it interesting in Romans 5, Paul says when someone is struggling, mourn with those who mourn. He doesn't say give them theological advice. He doesn't say to preach to them. He says mourn with them. And some of you who are not suffering at this time, but you know someone is suffering, you need to tell them, I am so sorry for your loss. Don't preach to them. I don't know what to say, but I'm here for you. And sometimes, you know, especially after a funeral, you don't say anything at all. You just, you just hug them. Well, at this time, maybe imaginary hug with a mask on. So you just be there with them, you know? And so th that leads us to the next question, okay? How do I protect myself from loss? If you've been through a loss that hurts, I think you reach to a point of choice eventually in the healing process. There's a part of you that's going to say, I don't want to go through this pain again. If I give my heart to another, he or she might reject me or die. If I give myself to a dream, that dream might shrivel up and die. I might fail and I don't want that kind of hurt anymore. So how can I protect myself from loss? And the short answer to this question is that you can't in this world. People sometimes think that being a Christian means that you have to pass some suffering. And that's not what Jesus said. Jesus says, as you said, in this life, in this world, you will have suffering. You will have tribulation. Okay? So you can choose to love, which means to risk. It means sometimes you'll be heartbroken. 
and in pain, or you can choose to be safe and die. You know, one of the great uh, Christian writers of our time, I, I quote him all the time, is C.S. Lewis. Did you know at the age of nine, he lost his mom? Do you know how close he was with his mom? So you know what he did? That death of his mom completely changed the way he has lived his life. You know, his whole life, he arranged his life and his relationships that, that, that will save him from, from, from rejection, from hurt and loss. You know, Lewis became a great Christian, a brilliant thinker, a great novelist. But you know what? He actually never fell in love because he's so afraid of love because he would be afraid of losing that love. He didn't fall in love until in his late 50s. But you know what oddest thing happened in his late 50s? He fell in love with a woman from America. Her name was Joy, not Lee. And initially when he met her, he was ambivalent about the wonders of love and the fears of being hurt. But he eventually fell in love with her and he also, also fell in love with her son, okay? But then you know what happened? She developed a terminal disease. And then she went into remission for a while and it was sort of a roller coaster and then she did eventually die. And while he was in the midst of that, he wrote some of the most brilliant words on pain and suffering. This is what he writes. To love at all is to be vulnerable. Love anything and your heart will certainly be wrung and broken. If you wanna make sure of keeping it intact, you must give your heart to no one, not even to an animal, especially a cat. I actually didn't write that, okay? Wrap it around carefully with hobbies and little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safe in the casket or coffin of your selfishness. In that casket, it is safe, dark, motionless, and airless. It will change your heart. Yes, your heart will not be broken, but it will also become unbreakable, impenetrable, and unredeemable. Is that the kind of heart you want? And some of you in this Zoom room have been hurt and you're, being af you're afraid of being hurt again. You closed up your heart. You don't wanna think about that memory of the past. So you refuse to love. You're afraid to dream. You avoid friendship on a deep level. You flee from risk. You isolate yourself. That is a sure way to death. It really is. And for some of you in this Zoom room, it's, to it's time to choose life fully again. And so that brings us to the next question. It's one of the deepest questions that a human being can ask. The question is, where is God? Where is God in all this? In the midst of pain and suffering and loss in our life, okay, where is God? And I'll be frank, I don't have a lot of easy answers for this and I actually don't have an answer for a lot of your questions, okay? Some of you guys are like, you know, if God is really loving, if he exists, there shouldn't be pain and suffering at all, okay? And people sometimes wonder, couldn't God created a different kind of world. Don't you think like that sometimes? I do, where there's no pain or suffering, where everything goes according to plan, that every day God can write a specific script for you so that you won't have to go through loss and suffering. I mean, for a moment, I want you to kind of think of what, what kind of world that would look like. I don't know if you knew, knew this, but I love movies, okay? And one of my favorite movies actually came, there's actually two movies. It was based on a novel in 1972 called The Stepford Wives. I mean, have you guys seen that? It came out in 1975. Okay, I didn't watch it when I was six. I watched it much later. There's another version in 2003 by Nicole Kidman. That's not as good, okay? It's not as good, okay? But 1975 is much better. It's about this little community, okay? And it's a, a, a new couple comes in. And this wife has a personality. She's very feisty. And she sees the oddest thing. From the hu husband perspective, everything is perfect. The wives are perfect. The wives are, are submissive. They cheerfully love to cook and sew and clean. They do everything to, to, to give uh, pleasure to their husbands. There's never any fights, there's never any conflict. And, but strange thing happens. Whenever a new couple comes in, their wives are completely changed. And this happened to her best friend. And then you know what happens? To her horror, she discovered that they're, longer, they're no longer real people. They're actually robots. The real wives are done away with, they're, they die. Now, sorry for revealing the end, but this summary, sermon is about suffering. But in the last frame of this film, in the 1975 version, the 2003 is much different. This wife who used to be a feisty character, she's like blissfully cleaning and cooking, okay? And at the end of the film, we know what happened to her. She's not a person anymore. Now, you husbands out there, I wanna ask you this question, and I'm gonna get in trouble for this question, but I gotta say what the Lord wants me to say, right, okay? 
Okay, this is for all the husbands of KCPC. Would any of you be interested in a roboticized wife who will do anything, who has no mind, no will at all, whose only interest is to serve you, prepare your meals for you, clean you, can make your home your personal castle, your throne, okay? They'll try to anticipate your every desire. They'll never argue with you. And they, in fact, they know what you want before you want it. Would anybody want a, want a wife like that? And, and the answer is definitely no, right? Okay, I, I sound very convincing, right? Okay, the answer is no, okay? And, and the thing is, God could have made a Stepford world, okay? He could have created robots, obedient in every detail. But God was so full of love, he created beings in his own image, okay? Where he, they, they were made his own, that we have the right to choose. And he gave the ability to choose him and be obedient or choose your own life and be disobedient. But, but you know what happens? The Bible teaches that the fall happened because of that disobedience. And now he unleashed forces of death, pain, suffering, and loss. And we need to be very clear on God's heart in all of this. I think people sometimes misunderstand and think God is this cruel character who sends out pain, a tornado or an accident in our life. The Bible does not speak of death in that way. He talks death is not as a tool or suffering as a tool, but as an enemy of God. He says, actually, the last enemy is death. He is eternally opposed to it. And no matter what you hear in our day and our culture, if God is so good, if there's a God, I just want you to say God is more against death than you are, more against suffering than you are. Okay, this was not God's plan for his creatures, the people he loves. So where is God? Okay, where is God? If God is so opposed to suffering, where is God? Well, God is with those who are suffering. He absolutely hates death. Let me give you an example of this. Remember Jesus when he raised Lazarus from the death? Do you remember his response before that? It wasn't like, oh, I'm going to raise him from the death, so it's all good. Do you remember his response? He is angry. He is mad. He weeps. Remember? Why is he not sp smiling? In literally a minute, he's going to raise Lazarus from the dead. I mean, he, for him, it's not like a little deal. He doesn't say, it's okay, Martha. It's okay, Mary. This death is terrible, but I'm going to raise him from the dead. Okay? He doesn't smile. He is angry. He is angry towards death. This is pure realism. He hates evil, pain, and suffering more than you do. There's no sentimentality out of it, okay? And here's the thing. You have to realize, the more and more you realize that you are the reason for the suffering, that we are the reason for suffering, we're the ones, it was our evil that put him on the cross. The more you realize that, you're, the more you realize that you brought suffering upon yourself, the, the more we're able to respond, it, respond to suffering in a biblical way. Think about this, the cross of Jesus Christ was the greatest act of unfairness and evil in the world, and yet the greatest good came out of it. So there's a plan for you too. There's a plan for your loss, for your suffering and your injustice. I don't, need, I don't know what your reason for your suffering is, okay? I don't know. I know what it isn't. It isn't because he doesn't love you. He groans and cries deeper than all of you, than all of you when you're going through pain because of his great love for you. You know, one of the most profound books of suffering I've ever read is a, a book written by a man named Nicholas Wosterstoff. He went to Calvin College. I think that's where, I think that's where uh, Joy went to school as well. I'm not sure, in Grand Rapids. But he went to Calvin College. Then he eventually went to Yale University to, to teach there on philosophy. And he was a Christian. And he writes this book. You should read it. It's called Lament for a Son. It's a great book, very revealing, very honest. And it was written on occasion of the death of his oldest son, Eric, who died at the age of 25 while he was rock climbing on a mountain. And he says that the hardest thing about this death of his son was just the finality of it. That, that he, he looks at this picture of his son when he was six years old of a fish that he carried that was almost as big as he was. And he says he, the hardest thing that he will, that is that it's just everything is so final that he will never be able to hear his voice ever again. And one time when he's like, you know, going over his things, he, he imagines his son actually saying, hey, dad, I'm back. But he realizes that's just an illusion. That was just a dream. And so he realizes he's never going to hear that voice again. And he came to see the suffering God. And he wrote some of the most profound words I've ever heard from, from a person about God. This is what he writes. Maybe the greatest thing about God is that he, that he would choose to suffer with us when he did not have to. No matter what you've gone through, he is still your God. 
every tear that has fallen from the face of every human being that has ever lived is precious to him. And that is the message of the cross, that our creator, the God in the Bible, suffers with you and for you in the midst of your suffering and loss. Okay? So that's the fourth. And the last question is, to live in a world of suffering and loss, biblically, you must see God as your father. You must see God as your father. Okay? I'm actually, there's one other point as well. In verse 16 and 7, it says, we are children. We're co-heirs with Christ. I think most of us don't see God as, as a father. Can most of you guys see God as a boss, as a dictator? Okay? You will not handle suffering well if you don't see him primarily as your father. A lot of you guys, you have this wage-based relationship with your God. You really see him as a boss. And so you start accusing him when things are not working in your favor. You feel like life is not fair. Where are my wages? Where are my benefits? No, you owe me, God. I worked hard. I did all these things. Isn't that the attitude of the older son and the, and the prodigal son? You owe me. But it says that God is primarily your father, Abba. Okay? And so how does a father respond to a child that's in pain, that's crying? They run like the wind to help that child, right? You know, fathers in our church, I know because I've seen them run. They're very slow. They're very slow. Some are slower than others, okay? All right? But I bet you, every one of our fathers, especially Phil, they'll beat you in a foot race if their child is crying or they're in pain. And I don't care if your name is Forrest. They will beat you in a foot race, okay? Because of, the, because of his great love for his three sons. I mean, haven't you heard stories of mothers lifting a car to save their babies, okay? So how much more our God, our Father who is perfect, who loves you infinitely more than a mother or father can ever love their child. It, it, it doesn't really matter if that kid, child was good or bad that day, right? We will run to that child when they're hurt. It's a good father runs to you when, they're in pain, when you're in pain. So you need to see God primarily, not as a boss, not as this, this great provider, great whatever. You got to see him as your loving father. And a lot of times children can't comprehend what the father's doing. You know, when the father said, don't do that, don't put rocks in your mouth. They're like, why? I love rocks. I mean, even, don't even wives say that out of love for their husbands? Don't loving wives tell us, hey, don't put that vegetable in your mouth. It's bad for you. Don't put that grilled chicken in your, in your mouth. It's bad for you. What do they say? Because I did a great love for you. Put that steak in your mouth, honey. Put that barbecue in your mouth, honey. Okay, I'm sorry, I was dreaming. I thought I was in heaven. Okay, but even wives do that, right? All right so how much more a father a, or a, a mother to their child? But even when they're rebelling against you, they instinctively know that their father loves you and wants the best for you. Same thing, we adults. Can you, comp can you understand what God's doing in the universe? Do you really know? Can you even comprehend his great redemptive plan for you and the universe? Do you un really understand it? So no matter how you feel at the moment, okay? Don't trust your feelings. God loves you and is for you. And the last point, you must see your life your current life of suffering in the light of eternity. You must see your current life of suffering in the light of eternity. I know, I know storms come into every life and into mine as well, but do I live in the light of that truth? You know, life is very simple if you think about it. Okay, we're the ones who complete. Life should be very simple. You know, we're, we're called to embrace God. We're, we're called to embrace every moment of our life. You know, in a world that's incredibly fallen, incredibly painful, it's a wonderful gift from God. Now, we get so preoccupied by stuff that doesn't really matter. But God says, every moment that you have is a gift from me. You know, just, a, just a month ago, there's a doctor I spoke to at our church. He says that his purpose in life now is that even the mundane things of life, I'm going to be thankful. I'm going to be thankful. So this life is a gift. Even when you go through tremendous pain and suffering and loss, it's a gift. So place your trust in Christ. Love those who, around you. Okay? But here's the thing, not only for this life, but in the life to come. You know, I think we, our secular worldview, it, it gives us the least resources to respond to suffering. You notice that? You know, when, when the secular worldview tells you there's nothing beyond this life, okay? There's no remedy. There's no cure. There's no vaccine. You're under the tyranny of the present. I think no age has, has been more unprepared than in this age in response to suffering, right? Well, what's the thing that you, you young adults said like 10 years ago? Was, was it YOLO? Was it YOLO? JLO, JLO, whatever? Was it you live? Was it 
you only live once? That's actually unbiblical. You actually live twice in the afterlife, okay? Our second worldview is eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow you're gonna die. I mean, there's no real hope in that kind of thinking, right? There's no hope. Your whole life is about escapism. It's like just avoid it, avoid it. it's not real. But when storms of life hit, what happens? You don't stand, you don't become still. You, 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 get, you get depressed and you have no hope. Now Chuck Swinnell once said this, a human can live no longer than 40 days without food, three days without water. For Sam, three hours without coffee. But you can't live a second without hope. You can't live a second without hope. And to the degree that you really believe in the sharing and security of the future is how you can live in the present to the max. You know, there's a lot about this world that you just cannot count on. You cannot put your hope on. You can't put your hope in the weather in Cleveland. You don't know what it's going to be like. It's like it has bipolar disease, right? Disorder. Can you trust? Can you put your hope in a stock market? A lot of times it seems like a game, okay? That needs to stop, right? right? We've seen this story before. We've seen this movie on ANC a lot. Uh, but do you have assurance? Do you have this hope on this paramount issue? Your eternal destiny. Okay, I don't know why I had Darth Vader's voice at that time, okay? When I said destiny, not child, please, right? And that's what talk, Paul talks about here in verse 18. And Paul, he's, he's like a Rayman. Rayman is like my hero. He's adding it up. He's like, okay, the sufferings that I'm going through right now, okay, uh, does not equate to the glory that I'm going to have forever. Right? He start, he's, he's doing math, right? If you think about it, it's a mathematical calculation. He's like, okay, I'm going through a lot of hell right now. I'm going through a lot of loss right now. I'm going, but it doesn't even compare to eternal glory I'm going to have. And if you really believe that, and to the degree that you believe in that, it's much easier for you to face anything in life. And so this, what's this glory? The glory of being resurrected, of ruling in this kingdom, being co heirs to rule the whole universe, the eternal presence of the king, to, to be adopted as his kids forever that we have with him. That is a wonderful hope, rooted in a sure thing, amen? And, and, and I think it, you'll be a fool to not live for the future and only live for YOLO, right? It's, you're supposed to live for eternity. Well, I want to end at this, and you should buy the book, okay? But at the end of the book, you know, he talks, Wolstow talks about the hope of the resurrection, where it says God resurrects all those who died. And he's, he's thinking about the mass of humanity that God has in mind, those who have died and those who are still living, and those who have not been born yet. Every human being that's ever lived and died, and that God knows them all. He's very honest. This is what he says. I don't see how he's going to do it. I don't see how God's going to, but I suppose if he can create human beings, he can recreate. I wonder if it's all true. Um, I wonder if God's really going to do it. When I hear Eric someday say, hey, dad, I'm back. Then he writes from the voice and words of God. He says, remember, I made all this and raised my son from the dead. The Bible says that the day is coming. It might not be today or tomorrow, but a day is going to come when this will be the truth. The home of God is among mortals, and he will dwell with them as their God. They will be his people. God himself will be with them, and he will wipe every tear from their eyes. The day is coming when death will be no more, and mourning and crying and pain will be no more, for the old orders have things that passed away. Then he finishes with this. Okay, so goodbye, Eric. Goodbye until we see each other again. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth, or not worth, not even in the same di discussion compared with the glory that will be revealed in us. And the more you think about your eternal destiny, the more you can live in the present in life to the max. And I'm gonna pray for us. And um, uh, Phil's gonna lead us in a, in a great uh, um, uh, song called Still, that in the midst of the storm, you can rest, you can be still in his love and his protection and your salvation. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for your great love. Thank you for your promises, for these are trustworthy and true. May we think of eternity more and more to fuel us for the present. And we thank you so much for your goodness. And for those who have great loss in their families, I pray for them for healing, for, for, a, real, for a new life, and I pray that they will share their loss. I pray they will not avoid it or try to escape it on, the, on their own. And I pray 
that their life here would be greater and greater and greater each day. We pray this in Jesus' name. pray. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his light shine upon you and be gracious to you and make his face turn towards you and grant you shalom by peace. We pray all this in your loving care in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you all. Have a great week.